me? Hello? Can you guys hear me? My name's Safi, and I'm a writer and editor. I'll be moderating this panel today. Um, this is Jason. This is S.E., Sylvia, and Nick, and they're all really awesome thinkers and writers and academics. Um, I'm a writer and an editor. I'm not an academic. It's been a long time since I've thought of any kind of critical theory. So bear with me if it seems like I really don't know anything. It's because I don't. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'd like to introduse um, uh, SE first um, to present their paper. Hi. <laughs> The slides visible on the thing. <laughs> Groovy. Hi, uh, I'm S. E. Hackney. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh in Library and Information Science, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Wikipedia page for shorts. Um, I highly encourage you to look at this article uh, on Wikipedia while I'm talking, uh, but I would also ask that you not edit it right now, <laughs> um, <laughs> because if more than one IP address is trying to edit it at the time, it might get locked down, and then nobody will get to edit it, and that's no fun. Um, so, because this is a conference about the internet, I'm going to assume some very general knowledge about the existence of Wikipedia, um, but I do want to go over some basics of sort of how uh, content gets created and how communication happens on Wikipedia before we dive into shorts. So, Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Uh, anyone meaning uh, anyone with access to Wikipedia um, and you can either sign up with an account or your IP address will be logged with your edits and what makes Wikipedia interesting from my point of view uh, at least is that all of the versions of all of the pages on Wikipedia exist and are accessible all the way back to the beginning of when a page was created. And that means not only the front-facing articles that you read when you look something up on Wikipedia, but also the back channels of Wikipedia where communication happens about what should be on this page, what should be taken down, what sources we're looking for. And those are things like talk pages. Every article has a talk page, which is essentially like a discussion board for what should be happening in this article. Uh, user pages, every user has their own page and they also have a talk page and edit revisions and summaries where you can say here are the changes that I've made and this is why I made them and all of that is viewable and accessible by anyone. There's no such thing as private messaging on Wikipedia. So with that in mind, because anyone can edit it, I think it's important to discuss who is actually editing it. 90% of Wikipedia editors are men and the vast majority of editors are white. And the content on Wikipedia reflects that. Not only in terms of what subjects and types of people and histories get articles written about them, but also what pages get more attention, um, what are considered good pages by Wikipedia and get featured and displayed as the best of what Wikipedia can do. And there are a bunch of really great initiatives working to sort of bridge that gap. Um, Wiki.edu, Art Plus Feminism, AfroCrowd are just a few, but uh, I want to talk about here about how this discrepancy in who creates on Wikipedia manifests in subtler ways uh, and how the openness of Wikipedia fails marginalized groups at a structural level. So that brings us to shorts. Um, it's a little difficult to read here, but shorts are a garment 
worn by both men and women, sorry everyone else, um, over their pelvic area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is from a couple of days ago. Hopefully the live page doesn't look too different from this right now, but we see this outline, this picture of this woman and her trainer uh, in shorts. And just as a brief aside, this woman is named uh, Mariana de Melo, and she is an Argentinian swimsuit model slash actress. Um, and I really hope that she has this on her resume, <laughs> um, that she is the face of shorts. Um, so I ran like a basic word frequency analysis of the content of shorts, and I took out stop words, uh, your basic stop words like a and the, and then also some subject specific ones, most notably the word shorts. Um, so that I could sort of see what's being talked about on this page besides actually the words shorts over and over again. Uh, and this very fancy word cloud, we can see that women overwhelmingly uh, is the subject of this article. This is the word that appears in related terms. So with that in mind, I want to think about who is the content of this page and who are the creators of it? Uh, whose bodies are on display here and how are they talked about? Um, so the two images on that side of the screen are acceptable. They are okay to be on the Wikipedia page for shorts. But these two images apparently are not fit to be on the Wikipedia page for shorts. The two in the middle here are actually live on the page uh, right now, but uh, so this image of the U.S. women's uh, volleyball team was the main image of shorts before the image that's up there now, and we can see that it's a picture of their butts. You can't see their faces, um, and so I decided a couple of years ago to change it to this picture of these extremely ugly shorts because I thought it was funny, um, and then. Once I posted that, it was reverted, and this is the um, edit comment from taking this image down and replacing it back with these, uh, the U.S. Women's Volleyball Team, changing main image as it has people wearing shorts, and thus it better explains visually what shorts are. Sure, <laughs> fine. One of the main pillars of Wikipedia is to assume good faith, and so I, in good faith, assume that that is absolutely the motivation for why this is a better depiction of shorts than this is. So then I changed it to this picture here of a body wearing shorts. Uh, and that was taken down as the main image of Wikipedia of the page again and replaced with this same one. But it's there as the image for jean shorts. So it's good enough for that, <laughs> but not good enough to be the main image. And then also we see the Australian women's beach volleyball team, this is under bun huggers, which I would argue are not shorts, but that is a whole other thing, right? But that still exists on this page, and there's also this weird women's volleyball undercurrent happening here for whatever reason. But we also see this is uh, written content, denim shorts are worn by both genders, or shorts are now a common wear for females. Like, the type of language that's happening here says so much about who is on it. But with that in mind, I do want to note that there's a line, like what is there now and what I just showed you is okay, but there is a line of what is not acceptable, and it does get crossed. So this edit here, the bottom one on this pair at the top, is an IP address that changed the image for short shorts to what used to be an image here, what we no longer have access to because it was taken down from Wikimedia, but the file name is woman in wife beater braless with gray shorts in public park .jpg. <laughs> um, And about four hours later, after this gets uploaded to the page, this user, Mavalu, takes it down saying, the IP address that's obsessed with the picture of a random woman in see-through clothing is trying to add a picture again. <laughs> Right? So this is an ongoing thing, apparently, that's happening on this page, and there are people who are paying attention. Right? It's not a free-for-all. There are rules, 
and policies about what is okay, explicit or implicit, on this page, but the images and the language that I just showed you doesn't make that cut as being unacceptable. So we really have to, when you read this, you get an impression, however subtle, of like who is, who is engaging with this topic, who is the content of it versus who is creating it. So I think this establishes a status quo on these pages and sort of implicit policies about what's okay. Um, this is the very first version of the page for shorts. You can go back and see every version in between this one and the one that's live now. You say, shorts are a garment worn by both men and women over their pelvic areas and upper legs. It's pretty similar to what's up there now, and it's sort of, Wikipedia changes, content tends to get kept unless it's like explicitly determined that it's not, that it crosses some line. So like it has mutated from this, but starting here, it's grown out and stayed sort of from this seed. So I would say that w Wikipedia has created this playing field, this flat landscape, but because the playing field in the world is not even, it cannot be created evenly in this space. This pure, simple openness is not equitable because the people who already have the power, the privilege, and the access to histories recreate that world in these spaces. It matters at this level. There's so much good work happening trying to get a more diverse editing body on Wikipedia in terms of bridging that gender and race gap, but it matters in shorts too, even though it's innocuous, it's shorts, right? But it manifests here, and so it's something that we encounter whether we engage with it explicitly or not, and it's telling us things subtly about who is allowed to be in the world. So the dream of the web 1.0 is over. We're not creating a utopia online and we're at the point now where it has to be subverted rather than created better and new and without the structural inequalities that we all live with in the real world. So I would leave you with this. Why not this? Why not make this the main image for the Wikipedia page for shorts? We see this image and we have like this reaction to it. We like giggle and laugh. There's this like absurdity about the idea of this being the main image for the Wikipedia page for shorts. And I think that discomfort and that absurdity is what we need to engage with in order to get into the liminal spaces in order to subvert this platform that has been created for everyone, but manifests the same inequalities that we all live with. This, the discomfort is the point of entry. Uh, so I would leave you with this image and just say thank you, and you can reach me via email, on Twitter, or on Wikipedia. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Farman, Associate Professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. Uh, and I'm working on a book uh, about waiting and the history of waiting as it relates to the messages we send each other. Uh, and that's part of the talk that I'm going to do uh, today. So we're now connected globally in really complicated ways. And one of the ways that we live those connections is through sending messages to one another. We keep in touch. But as this scales, we are presented with a problem of bandwidth, of the ability for the technology to keep up with the messages that we exchange. And this is true throughout history. You look at message exchange technologies, and as it scales out and becomes more complex, uh, we face a problem of what the system can actually hold and what it can maintain. Uh, so we find that much of our lives right now uh, on the internet are um, done through message exchange, uh, and no matter how robust 
our technologies are, we're presented with moments where we have to wait. Uh, and waiting connotes in a bad way in the West, almost across the board. Whenever I present the word waiting, you're probably cringing inside, thinking of all the moments that you've had to wait and the awful nature of waiting, uh, whether it be for transportation or for that person to respond to your email. Finally, we hate the boredom that's associated with waiting. Uh, we hate the wasting our time, uh, especially when time is so limited. We hate not knowing when someone is supposed to respond to us, what are they thinking? What's the response going to be? And we're left uh, there waiting. And the focus of my talk today, we hate buffering. We just hate buffering. And this is probably already annoying many of you, this slide here, just seeing that spinning wheel is this awful fingernails on chalkboard kind of thing. But I, in the book, I'm, I'm arguing that we're looking at waiting entirely wrong. Uh, waiting isn't this in-between time. Uh, instead, waiting is a core part of the messages itself. Waiting is a core part of the exchanges that we engage in. It's um, a core part of the time that shapes us every day, but it's often overlooked, and that's sort of the power of waiting, is that we don't think about it except when it's extraordinarily painful or burdensome. Uh, it's often overlooked, and that's where the power of waiting lies. It can be used by the powerful uh, to maintain status quo in many ways. Uh, waiting, we wait differently. Uh, people wait differently, often depending on your status and your power. Uh, and waiting is a part of the messages itself. It's not just content exchange to content. The time is a part of the message itself. It's an interpretive moment. Uh, we take that moment of waiting and it becomes something that we give meaning to. We engage in meaning making as we wait for messages. So content of online exchanges, we need to expand it. It's not just the messages or the photos or the videos we send, it's also the time. It's the waiting time becomes a part of the content that we're uh, exchanging. So. And counterintuitively, there are times that we actually prefer waiting, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, uh, that there are moments where we actually want to wait, we prefer waiting, uh, and uh, it becomes, a, uh, at moments, a very pleasurable thing, actually. So lastly, we also need to embrace waiting as a way of demystifying the, the, the notion of instantaneous culture, that our message technologies will connect us at ever accelerating paces. Uh, instead, we need to embrace waiting as a core part of how we connect with one another and a fruitful part of that. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of loading, uh, where it came from uh, for computers and the internet. Uh, it started with the Xerox Star in uh, 1981. This was the first commercial system available, and it had had um, an hourglass uh, as a part of it. That was sort of the icon, and that carried over into graphical user interfaces. The Xerox Star, as a first commercial computer, it, it allowed the people, they were networked computers, and they allowed people to do things at a speed that they hadn't really done before. But if you talk to people who use these computers, the thing that they'll say over and over again is how slow the thing was. It took forever to load and to, to exchange files, to exchange messages, it took forever, even though it was um, faster than anything that they had done before. So. Um, the Xerox Star in 81 uh, carried over into Apple's Lisa computer in 1983. That also used an hourglass. The next iteration was uh, graphic designer Susan Kerr uh, designed the wristwatch icon. Uh, there's some awesome murals of this icon around the world. Um, and so that was 84. Uh, Susan Kerr says, for the love of God, who uses hourglasses? Let's get on with it. Let's do a watch. Um, but uh, Microsoft Windows. A year later, goes back to the uh, hourglass. Um, so the first um, internet version of this is the uh, Netscape Navigator here. So this is called the Throbber. Uh, so this is 1994. Uh, this is the first buffering icon that we have uh, for, for the web. Uh, around 2006, 2007, uh, we're presented uh, Microsoft Vista has this circular blue icon, and this is now sort of the ancestor of what we know as that online buffering icon. Um, and in the late 80s, Unix machines had the beach ball of death uh, that then carried over into Apple's HyperCard from Macintosh, uh, and then the uh, spinning beach ball of death is uh, the one that launched with uh, Mac OS X uh, in mid-2001 um, called the spinning weight cursor. So the consequences of our wait times online especially um, are of a big concern, especially to businesses. So Amazon did a study and they said for every hundred 
milliseconds of latency, of delay on their site, they lose 1% of their revenue. That's kind of insane. 100 milliseconds of delay leads to a 1% loss in revenue. So they're very concerned about latency, about about how people feel about waiting. Uh, this carries over into video as well as we watch videos. Um, after five seconds, 20% uh, of the people who are trying to watch that video while it's buffering, five seconds later, they're gone. Uh, 10 seconds later, half of the people who started watching that have left. So there's an abandonment rate of 50% after 10 seconds. 20 seconds later, it's up to 70% of people uh, are gone. So we have an acute awareness of duration, of time, and that's always really linked to the technologies of our moment. Uh, the technologies of our time shape how we understand and, and experience duration and experience time. Uh, and for us, we're, we're acutely aware of how long things take. Part of this is a cognitive process. At about two seconds, we begin to move on to the next task unless something calls us back. And part of it is very cultural. We wait differently. We have different expectations. Part of that is technological, how quickly we understand our technologies should be working. So much of it is around expectations. So designers... Um, brought this to bear uh, as they started bringing progress bars, percent done progress bars into, the, into computers and onto the web. In 1980, uh, Brad Myers, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, was working with uh, businesses right before he started grad school, and he started attaching progress bars to everything on the computer, and people responded very positively. Prior to that, you know, you just had some kind of indication that things were happening, but as soon as it lets you know that there's going to be an end in sight, we are willing to wait much longer. So with buffer icons, which are just random, there's no percent done, there's no indication of when that little spinning thing is going to stop. We're still willing to wait about three times as long as, uh, in comparison to if there is no visualization of you are, something is happening behind the scenes. Um, but with percent done uh, progress bars, we're willing to wait even longer because we know there's an end in sight. And what's fascinating is comparing this and you know this, we, if they take exactly the same time, if you calculate them and they are both 10 seconds. One of them is a spinning icon, one of them is a percent done progress bar. We feel that this is shorter um, because there's an end in sight. Uh, what's, and I asked Brad Myers about this as I was interviewing him. I said, what's up with the proliferation of these spinning buffering icons when really we prefer the percent done. What is going on? Why are we doing this? And he said, people are lazy. You know, designers are very lazy. Uh, but on the other hand, the internet is a really fluctuating thing. Uh, bandwidths and, and speeds change at a, at a moment's notice. And sometimes this might be moving along just fine. And then you get to 99% done and it stalls and you're pissed off about it. Uh, so they, are, they fear creating people who, with dissatisfaction versus just, just hang on, just wait. Um, so we are often presented instead with uh, the progress bar or the, um, the spinning buffer. If you've ever downloaded an app, which you have, uh, and it looks like this a little bit, uh, as it kind of spins around and loads, what's fascinating to me is that designers manipulate this. So the actual speed around which it loads has absolutely or has very little to do with the data that's actually being transferred onto your device. The ways that it's manipulated is it's front-loaded, so it kind of stalls the beginning slowly, and then it speeds up at the end. Watch it the next time you download something. This is manipulated to make you feel good, as opposed to, wow, it's going fast. Oh, no, it's not going fast anymore. Oh, it's just stalled. And then if it's exactly the same time, in either case, you get frustrated with one and you feel like it was fast with the other. Uh, so again, the technologies communicate a perception of time and, and duration. Now, when do you prefer to wait? Facebook did a, um, began launching security scans of your profile where you could have it scan your, your profile and it would send you back any sort of threats to security or things you should know about with security. It's an extraordinarily fast process. It spits back the information instantly. And when it did, people didn't trust it. They said, oh, that was too fast. Um, I don't believe it was very thorough. And they didn't believe it. They just went on. They didn't change their settings. And Facebook said, this is so bizarre. It's a very easy process, but we, we gave them the information too quickly. So what they did is they do the same exact process. They scan your profile, and then they put in a little bit of code that's pause, just wait. And then it gives you the results. And then people responded so positively to this. They began changing their settings. They began going in and tweaking it. They began to trust it because they felt it was thorough. So the technology is actually ahead of our expectations, but our expectations of thoroughness 
dictate how we experience duration. And now you have travel sites doing the same exact thing. So if a travel site can quickly give you results, uh, we often don't think that it was thorough enough. So they are similarly building in a buffer, a delay, uh, so it's a false latency to give you a sense that they've done their job. Uh, so they're building in time, even though the technology is, a, is ahead of our experiences, we have cultural expectations about thoroughness and time uh, that are now built into this. Um, this applies to launch events too. Um, we, you know, Apple builds this in terms of uh, getting us excited about the technologies. They, they build in anticipation. They make us wait, but the waiting is how we then link to the product that they're trying to sell us. We, we have this desire. Uh, so waiting builds desire. Waiting is often even more powerful than the thing itself because uh, we're imagining us holding whatever the iPhone 8 is going to look like. Uh, and it's a, for them, they know it's an extraordinarily powerful thing to have the imagination work during that wait time to build uh, anticipation for uh, a product. Roland Bart has a great book called The Lover's Discourse where he talks about sort of the eroticism of waiting. Uh, so sending messages between he and his lover, that wait time is such a powerful part of their relationship because it's, that's where the imagination and fantasy builds and I think corporations often uh, kind of prey on that as well to get us excited and, and have kind of an erotics of waiting as well. And games, uh, casual gamers uh, know how to strategize with waiting as well because you have to then wait uh, five hours until you can click the cow again. Uh, how do you manage that? Uh, how do you deal with that wait time? And for, for them, the wait times are often just a part of the play uh, itself. So I'm writing a book uh, about this where I'm looking at waiting technologies, looking from text messages to pneumatic tubes here in New York City that exchanged mail from the late 1890s to the mid-1950s. I'm looking at the New Horizons spacecraft that took 16 months to send its messages back to the planet about after it did its flyby of Pluto and looking at explorers out in the world, uh, looking at the unknown from Lewis and Clark. Uh, to Charles Darwin sending their messages back and it shapes what we know, it shapes how we know waiting is a core part of knowledge production. I look at Civil War letters, I look at medieval royal seals as sort of these stamps of power, these marks that communicated the status of somebody, uh, all the way back to the very first messages we ever exchanged which were aboriginal message sticks uh, in Australia about 12,000 years ago, dating as far back as 40,000 years ago when uh, people first migrated onto the continent of Australia and began sending messages in the form of message sticks. Uh, so if you're interested in the book, you can uh, go to waitingforword.com uh, and you can sign up for messages from me uh, as I'll update you uh, about the book's progress. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Nick Hanford. I'm from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Um, and I'm writing my dissertation there on uh, video games and reader response theory. But I'm here today to talk about uh, open access journals and expanding open access, uh, building a feed forward journal. Specifically, I'm talking about the Journal of Games Criticism, which I'm the managing editor and editor in chief of currently. Um, so I want to start with just what is open access. And open access journals provide content to readers. Um, free and at least reasonably accessibly um, uh, from the publishing uh, corporation. And the general mission of open access journals is to increase availability and uptake of academic knowledges to a, a wide variety of readers outside of the academy. Um, we're going to come back to this at the end, um, but I'm going to talk about what I've been doing specifically um, with a group of graduate students. Uh, starting in the summer of 2013, we um, were doing a reading group of game studies literature. And we started uh, very early, all the way, uh, all the canonical texts and game studies up to today, but we were reading the academic literature with games critics and bloggers and people who were writing about the same sort of concepts and theories um, in a different way. And I started to notice a, a pretty distinct separation between these two groups where the um, critics and the bloggers, they would uh, always cite and talk about the concepts and theories of the game studies academics, but the game studies academics didn't really cite or read the, the bloggers, so there was this genuine knowledge disconnect between those two bases. And just to give us our, our influences, uh, Critical Distance is a, a fantastic resource for everyone. Um, if you're interested in games at all, they put out a weekly blog uh, roundup where they talk about what's been going on 
um, in that world. And in early 2013, um, at the University of Waterloo, uh, a couple of graduate students there started First Person Scholar. And their main focus was on feed forward middle state publishing, which is what they were uh, theorizing. Middle state publishing is simply, if you look, if we were to take a continuum and have um, the very specific academic journal that is just speaking to itself or speaking to a discipline and trying to further that, where on the other hand, you have typical journalistic, um, very wide audiences, um, game news sites, all that sort of stuff. Somewhere in the middle is where they wanted to be, bridging the gap between those two knowledge groups. Um, feed forward scholarship is what I'm going to be talking about mostly. And feed forward scholarship is just the idea that academics tend to often talk to ourselves. And in order to provide a um, productive ac uh, academic scholarship, we need to be able to um, provide takeaways to uh, a whole different range of stakeholders and audiences. So designers, developers, journalists, marketers of games, um, as well as other academics. We obviously need to appeal to them as well to ensure that this stuff gets taken up and uh, is disseminated. So the question is, how do we craft a feed-forward journal? Um, First Person Scholar is a blog. They're publishing weekly. They have editorial control. How do we translate that to a peer review model that tries to build a peer review from the ground up? And I'm going to talk about three specific things. Opening up language, altering our citation practices, and using solicitation. So we opened up our language in a few ways. The first one is that we ask our reviewers not to focus on um, necessarily how rigorous a person's language is or how rigorous their academic writing is, um, but we ask them to find out where people can define things more, where terms may be implicitly understood because they're a part of a, a, an audience, a knowledge base that may not uh, trans translate over to another group. Um, the other way that we focused on doing it was removing proofreading from the reviewing process um, <laughs> and trying to keep that as a technical editing thing. Um, so we don't really, we try to uh, move away from seeing uh, the presentation of the argument as central and, and seeing the argument um, as it is. This has helped along, the editorial board was made up of like 75% of the people who had worked at the university's writing center, which really helps with the reviewing process. Um, secondly, altering citation practices. If you've submitted to an academic journal or a book or something, you've probably gotten a reviewer that says, you didn't cite so-and-so, so you're probably wrong. Um, and that's just not helpful. Trying to build the canons of subdisciplines isn't something that we can really do, really, uh, to move on and move through this sort of thing. Um, so I have, this is a little uh, excerpt from our reviewer's handbook. Um, and if anybody's interested in this more, I could send you the reviewer handbook to get in, con get in contact with me. But we, Try to suggest sources minimally. Show restraint when you're suggesting sources to an author. If they're missing something, that's great, but don't uh, make it seem like this life or death thing. Um, and we see where we uh, had an uh, original place as reviewers to, to build on an argument was through our playing of, of different games. So we all focus on different games, and we all have experiences with those that we could offer to authors as examples to further strengthen their arguments. And lastly, I want to talk about using solicitation. So we uh, split up our, uh, our issues into articles and invited articles. Uh, articles go through the full double-blind peer review. Invited articles are people that we solicit, usually outside of academia, whether they be critics, developers, designers, that whole list of people that I talked about before. Um, and these invited articles go through editorial uh, review unless people want to go through the full double-blind peer review. Um, this is just a way of bringing in more people um, and ensuring that we got a wide uh, array of, of uh, authors. So this was three years ago, seven issues ago, 34 texts ago. Uh, that's how much we've published in the last four years. But, and we've constantly run into many more problems than this, but I'm only going to list three. <laughs> um, an inability to pay authors. When you 
take on an acad when you are running an academic journal, it is um, imperative that you don't pay people, which is you know awful. <laughs> but uh, if you were to pay people, uh, your legitimacy sinks through the ground. Now I'll get to legitimacy in a second. BSRs is already in the ground, so it doesn't really matter. But um, that has really made it difficult to reach out to those audiences that are writing for uh, making a living. Um, they're not going to spend hours upon hours crafting this lovely article for us just not to get paid and not have any um, future considerations unless they're going into academia. Uh, growing pains. When we started this journal, we were all either graduate students or professors at RPI. And it was very easy to when you see somebody just uh, to talk about the journal a little bit more, figure out what's going on. Um, as people have graduated, gotten new jobs, moved across the continent, um, it's much harder to keep it in the back of your, keep it in the forefront of your mind when you need to um, email every little thing or Skype every little thing. Uh, and lastly, I'm gonna go quickly through this one, legitimacy issues. When an uh, established academic opens up an editorial page of a journal and they see a bunch of graduate students, often they're not going to think very highly of the journal. Uh, they're going to think it's a graduate student journal. Um, and that has a whole range of problems with it. And just one last, I'm going to do a Rubio. So back to open access. Um, the general mission of open access is to open up the floodgates of academic knowledge to the wider publics. But the problem is, is that we've transferred over all of our uh, review processes, our academic writing practices from traditional paywalled journals. So we're not really opening up anything. And it's a, I'm hesitant to say this because I know it's a charge statement, but I hope it'll get some thoughts going. I, I, see open access as it currently is with people trying to make open access journals or transfer paywall journals to open access journals. I see it as a crutch to want to be public without having to engage with different publics. So we have this um, feed forward built up from the bottom ground and we've tried to <coughs> move more towards a public scholarship while allowing for proper credit to be given for academic work. So. If we're going to try to be public academics, we need to be putting our words and our theories and our concepts into, wor into a vocabulary that can be easily taken up by different sources. And if we don't have the giant infrastructure of, say, like popular science writing, which isn't a thing in the humanities, we don't have a, you know, a popular humanities magazine out there, um, this is the sort of way that we can get credit for our work without going to blogs and stuff that aren't really accepted by tenure review committees, uh, hiring committees, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm hoping that Feed Forward Scholarship can push us forward uh, and push open access forward a little bit more to try to deliver on some of the potentials that people saw in it. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sylvie Gutierrez. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, what my title says, it's Faith Cycles, Tech, New Utopian Vision, and the Body. And I don't really have like a prepared statement, I just kind of got a lot to say, so I'm going to um, get going and sort of lay out exactly what I'm going to say and then really get into it. So I'm first going to talk about cycles of uh, faith production and like kind of what faith is and how that is like used as a, as a mediator between um, sort of uh, situations where you currently are and like desires that someone wants, and then talk about how that is uh, playing out in like contemporary um, techno-utopian visions. And I'm gonna use two specific examples, the Transhumanist Party and Theranos, which was a blood testing company in Silicon Valley. And then I'm gonna talk about how like certain uh, implications or like some like takeaways from like that would be uh, a little background on me. I uh, recently got my BA from NYU where I studied um, 
uh, transference and like formations of images and from their identity and then like uh, how that was uh, shaded by technology. Okay. So uh, what exactly is faith? Here's a Merriam-Webster def de uh, definition. Um, it's uh, sort of like, as I underlined some important ones there, um, I kind of really see it as like a sort of like a, a blind adherence to um, a person, an idea, something that like drives you forward. It's like a one's concrete because like your resolve is very concrete, but it's also very whimsical in the fact that like you don't need that much basis to uh, formulate these ideas or formulate this like concrete theory of like what's going to push you forward or like what I actually believe is like God and like you know we don't have like concrete proof that there is a God or whatever, but like um, because of whatever resolve you have, that's what you have, and so it pushes you forward. Um, uh, does it, uh, yeah. Um, and then right here, uh, pretty much what I, what I started to think about, um, in, when I was uh, coming up with the idea for this paper was that, like, uh, there were, hmm, sorry, I'm just, like, a little frazzled, uh, if that wasn't clear, um, is that faith kind of arises from uh, a sort of uh, a, a need where you feel like a lacking where you currently are. Um, I included this image here of the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in like 70 AD, which was a sort of like pivotal moment in the um, changing of the subjugation of the, the Jewish identity, because at the time they were under the rule of the Roman Empire, and then like Jerusalem and Israel were still like a sort of like cultural home, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, this like gets torn away and so you get this like apocalyptic um, whatever moment where like your whole world is, cr is crumbling and uh, you don't really have anything to, to hold on to and from there that's where like it was around this time that like the first books of the New Testament the earliest gospels were in that sort of like offered this other alternative this sort of like salvation um, you can see I have this like apocalypse salvation here um, and uh, so like that and so in terms of like the New Testament and particularly the Gospels of like Mark and Luke, like this manifested in like, well now there's like a new figure and not only is there like a new figure for us to like rally around, but uh, it promises us um, eternal life, eternal salvation and like a kingdom of heaven and like somewhere that's like very separate from where we are now. So um, just, just to like reiterate, you're in this like little pit and then something comes along and is like, oh, but we can like lift you out and then so you, you like climb on that and it's like a rope and then it just like takes you out of this pit and then you're in like the sky or having like whatever like magical space that like makes you feel wonderful. I connected that right now to like a contemporary moment um, to like bring it forward to like what actually matters. Uh, and like what we're talking about now. Um, and that is, and like I use this image of like this like very like uh, crazy image here of like heroin e epidemic and like blah, 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 uh, old drug, new killer epidemic. That's not necessarily true, but like um, given uh, the space of like middle America, like no employment, um, uh, just sort of like drastic consequences of like neoliberal, uh, exporting labor overseas, you know, um, coal manufacturing, um, agriculture, what have you. Uh, you get all these these sort of wastelands of people, and um, uh, a lot of them start started to either turn to meth or heroin. Uh, I use heroin here because heroin really has um, uh, this sort of like connotation of like, oh, you take it and then you like, you know, you fall back. It's an opioid. It's a painkiller. It like like literally like saves you in like this. Uh, whatever, like, psycho-emotional state. Um, and uh, obviously, it's not, like, a new ep epidemic. When it says up here, it says, like, new killer epidemic. That's really only when, like, white people started doing it. And, like, the uh, within, like, the last 20, 30 years, when before, like, way before even Reagan, it was um, de destroying, um, uh, like, inner-city and minority communities. Um, but, like, recently... Uh, in the last like 10 to 20 years, people have been talking about it like, oh, it's like this crazy thing, and like it's like the the world is ending um, because of heroin and blah blah blah. And um, I think I'm kind of rambling and like going off uh, too far on a tangent that I need to right now. But uh, anyway, uh, heroin is 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 at once this like I, I include this cycle here because it's like heroin is at once this like uh, savior and the fact that it's a painkiller, but it also like puts you in like a like a like a hard addiction and it's like not a good thing by any means um 
anyway, sorry that took really long. Um, so uh, again, to bring that up to like um, this like contemporary moment here um, and talk about specifically like technology and uh, the web or whatever, like why we're all here. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, Silicon Valley and how faith um, powers different companies. Um, uh, s startups mainly, and with like uh, startup culture, Silicon Valley, I would say that you typically see like two different kinds of companies coming. You have the companies that say like, oh, like um, we want to like come up with a new easy way for you to like do your laundry or like get food delivered to your door, or, like take a taxi cab. But then there are other companies um, uh, that really come up with uh, sort of like future ideas and Elon Musk is like the big, uh, biggest purveyor of this, sort of like um, this sort of like s genius man who says like, oh, we can like totally change the world and we can totally like make the world a better place and, um, you know, travel from San Francisco to LA in, you know, 10 minutes and then like go live on Mars and, you know, like whatever. Uh, all like great ideas, but uh, as of now, like aren't necessarily feasible, so they need like a lot of like faith production, in this case like money, um, to uh, like fully function. So uh, I use Theranos as a great example of um, uh, this uh, sort of power, this like power like faith arc, like sort of rising and falling, like going from that like salvation to apocalypse thing. Theranos was a, um, a company started in like, uh, well I, sh I should have better notes, but it's like 2007. Um, Quick by Elizabeth Holmes, uh, who's this woman right here, uh, and she sort of. Hold on, I just want to see how I'm doing for time. Wow. Uh, she sort of uh, created a cult of personality around herself and like a great story about like what this company was doing. So on the paper, on paper, Theranos was a blood testing company. Usually, you take you need about like multiple pints of blood to um, sort of uh, test and like. Um, to have like um, enough data to uh, determine what's going on in your blood system, but Elizabeth Holmes um, supposedly created a system to only to do the same test with only a pinprick of blood, which is like in terms of scale like vastly different. And the idea of that was that like well that that blood we don't need this mass amount of data of blood because there's already so much data in blood because DNA is like the highest form of blood. I mean highest form of uh, data that we like know of. And um, and so be through like procedural algorithms or something like we can figure out with just a pinprick of blood like you know like what diseases you have for example um, and so for about seven years uh, the company like built itself up um, to like a nine billion dollar valuation and like uh, its board of directors had people like Henry Kissinger and like a bunch of other like um, like major uh, players in like American like state hegemony or whatever and. Um, uh, but then it came out about like a year and a half ago, if you've been following the story at all, that like this technology was completely bogus and that, um, you know, it had really been predicated on like, oh, we'll figure it out like at some point. Um, and, uh, but like it got to a point where that had, hadn't been figured out yet. And now the company is pretty much over and is being sued by the FDA and like all these other like crazy horrible things and Elizabeth Holmes herself who had this great story who had this like great cult around her she was kind of like so seen as like the female Steve Jobs blah 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 um kind of uh uh all came like crashing down um but again that was like totally predicated on the fact that people um at one point like believed and like bought into um this story and this company and uh, the sort of like, I, I wrote up here like snake oil space magic, which is kind of like, like, like we, like, just like trust us, like trust us and like we'll be okay. Um, which again, uh, is, uh, something that like just trust us and we'll like come up with the answers in the future. Um, but this is, uh, on this image here is, uh, more on like a, of a political scale. Um, this is a sort of campaign flyer for Zoltan Istvan, who was the head of the Transhumanist Party and who ran for president in 2016. I tried like really hard to find out how many votes he got, but like it, that information is just not anywhere. Um, you can see up here there's like uh, sort of like one word like ideas about like who this person is, like visionary, blah blah blah, like uh, journalist. I don't know why that's there. Um, and uh, pretty much what his idea and like the idea behind the Transhumanist Party is is that humans like um 
inherently like want to live forever humans enjoy life and so because of that they like strive to be immortal and so like the really the sort of like moral imperative that a human has is that uh they need to like invest and strive to gain this immortality um and he, he literally uses the words immortality and he believes that through research of like science and technology um humans will be able to live th forever either through like augmentation of the body or through some sort of like uploading to the cloud AI. He's really like a student of Ray Kurzweil and if I assume like a lot of you guys are familiar with him, um, I have a, a slide, next slide here that like um, is pretty much like a Kurzweilian arc of like improvements um, in, uh, it's called Countdown to Singularity, it's, it's sort of like uh, improvements and then um, in human evolution and the sort of time between them, and they uh, fall in a, in a line, and like right about at the bottom is when we're supposed to get AI, that sort of thing. And so Zoltan Istvan um, ran for president under the assumption that uh, if he were to win, he would really push for this sort of improvement in um, human life, and uh, the fact that, uh, yeah, I mean, Really, really, the one thing that he like really speaks on is living for, is living forever. Not necessarily improving your life in any ways, or improving social structures, or improving um, ways of life. But it's literally like you will live forever, and then like supposedly everything will get better. He also um, makes a big note of divesting from the military and sort of putting all of that money into this sort of like new initiative. So. Um, I see that as kind of like, oh, am I done? Oh, oh, I thought I just, okay. Uh, um, it, and so I see that as like, well, uh, um, investing for the military. Uh, so inv investing like now into the body. So like rather than like um, using the military as like a sort of, uh, like spear of empire, like now, like the body is like the new frontier of that. Um, uh, yeah, next slide. Um, like talking about the body, um, this is kind of like a like a weird binary image of like um, if you guys have any, if any of you have played the game Mass Effect, this is like where that's from, and like it's it's pretty much like you can see like a person here who is like augmented, who is like this like heightened human self um, via technology and uh, Again, like that's this is this is something that like both Zoltan Istvan and Elizabeth Holmes, as along with like many, I use them as like two examples in this like wider arc of that like, well, if we just keep going in with technology and we some sort of like put it in ourselves, we will become like these either like beautiful beings or like these little monsters. And um, hold on. But for whatever reason, like a lot of this talk is like really only centered like around the body and like the hu and like what it like exactly is um, the human. Like again, there aren't that many people who are really trying to be like, oh, like let's figure out how to use technology to like restructure the world in these like crazy like sci-fi utopian manners or whatever. Um, it's really uh, just centered back on like well, like what we have now, like what we have now is the body. Um, and I and that like personally like really distresses me because. It feels like um, like this very like uh, so you're at this like point of like apocalyptic moment um, uh, right now in the world, um, particularly in, in America, which I think I already touched on, and uh, not particularly in America, but like particularly in the whole world. Like we literally like like yesterday or whatever. There's like some like uh, Syria and like this like a ma massive class of ideology that like. Uh, pretty much started because of like a water-induced famine like five years ago, and like now it's really coming to a head where like everyone is like about to is like at each other's throats with nuclear weapons, and like that's really exciting and like really great that like oh like we're just gonna like blow up the world. So like instead of like um, like staying here and like figuring out how to deal with that, let's 
like turn our bodies into like computers and like go live in the cloud and like or like literally like find our way to like make ourselves better to like augment our bodies so that we're like not just humans that we become like superhumans or we become like these like new god beings um and just like find a way to like leave this planet this is a still from a movie called like elysium which uh came out a few years ago and is literally about like this exact scenario there's a like a group of like rich wealthy people who um uh, decide to like just live in a ring outside the earth because they're like you know what like we are better than everyone else like we don't have to deal with this bullshit like we can just like leave and life's better like we have like found our heaven we have like found our like eternity we have found our salvation from this like pit that we were in earlier um and uh there and like from there this like fe feels very um uh a sort of like racialized dialogue to me because like not only I mentioned like uh, heroin earlier and how that has been like a massive like destruction on American populace particularly like minority communities for about a hundred years but like not until recently has it become like an epidemic or like a problem because like now there's like white suburban moms who are like taking who like they run out of their Percocet medication after they get their face done and like then they just like go off and like start doing heroin everywhere. Um, last year or something, there were like more heroin deaths than gun deaths. And if everyone's like freaking out about like gun rights, gun violence, it's like, well, like all at the same time, like all these people are like dying from smack. Um, uh, and so yeah, like I said, that like like even like that dialogue is very racialized. But like particularly now, when you look at like the Silicon Valley and like the 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 movement to create like a like a faster, ha hotter, like leaner body. Um, uh, that like becomes such, like such an, obs uh, such an obsession that like it is powered on like nothing other than faith. Um, you really get, you really only see like this happening within like uh, majority like rich white communities, um, uh, and it's sort of like it goes beyond like a lot of what I'm talking about. Like it goes into like new tropics. So, like Soylent is very much this as well. Um, uh, like body mog, uh, like augmentations. Um, uh, new like sleep cycles so that you only sleep like two hours a day if you're like because like your sleep will be like that much better because you sleep in this like special bed and so like you only sleep two hours a day and then you're so much more productive and like you can do so much more with your time and like that becomes like a new currency in itself um i think at this point i'm kind of rambling and i've like repeated myself uh, a couple of times um so really just to s sum up there is that like the world is a really um like scary place right now and people are turning to technology in sort of fickle ways as a way to like save them and ultimately that can turn into like also scary things about like um uh people sort of like leaving or like leaving the human race and from there like well then you ask the question like well who gets to leave and it's like obviously it's the center like obviously like as i think um, other people in this in the panel have talked about it's like the whatever like hegemonic power that be like usually rises to the top given any uh, conflict. Um, so uh, I think I said a lot, so thank you so much. Hi guys, we're gonna open up the floor now for questions. So um, does anyone have a question? Hi, what's your name? Oh, I'm Renee. Hi, Renee. Um, this is a question for, I'm sorry, I'm horrible name, uh, Buffering. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in like the design, um, like icon design and stuff, and you mentioned how there's like different strategies for um, designing them. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, do you see any more design chains occurring? Um, I've noticed a lot of homogenous design lately. Like, is that a running thing? You buffering? noticed what? Oh, sorry. Um, homogenous design. Or oh, yeah. Everything kind of looks similar now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess I was just, what are the design trends for buffering for yeah. the future, do you think? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and I don't, I haven't really seen anything. You know, honestly, I think we've come to we're sort of stalling uh, with uh, the design of this because we have uh, expectations. And I think part of it is the ability for us to create websites using content management systems like WordPress templates. And these have pre-built loading icons in them that we expect. You know, So uh, you know, as we 
design these templates for people to use on the web. There are certain expectations of uh, the design that's built in those, so I think people are continually reiterating that because it fits the model and thus is profitable. Um, I don't know the answer though. I don't know what's next. I think that's a really good question. Um, and I know that you know we do sort of get stuck in these modes of reiter reiteration. Um, and it takes quite a while to get out of them. I think once people realize that the buffering tells us very little uh, and it, we have uh, less and less patience for that lack of feedback that um, we might turn back toward uh, percent done progress bars or a, a version of that that gives more detailed feedback. It'll be interesting to see though, but I, I, don't, I don't see anything on the horizon that I can kind of point to. It's a really good question though. Benjamin about um, the access or I, maybe you covered this and I missed it but what what do you exactly mean by feed forward and then a second question say something about Gamergate and whether that, if they've, I mean, okay when you're doing games journalism and you're trying to reach the public it seems like that's inevitable yeah uh, so feed forward and I I was looking through our reviewer handbook and I literally have a line in there feed forward is like porn, you know it when you see it. Um, but that's, it's, it's uh, simply the idea that, that academic writing needs to um, be about more than uh, furthering our own disciplines and furthering our own scholarship. That that knowledge is a useful thing, we just need to prove it to a certain number of stakeholders. So uh, we have emphasized more of a productive sort of model where we, we ask that people look towards design and developing games, um, how scholar of whatever criticism we're offering, whatever art, uh, arguments that we're offering, we ask authors to provide some concise and clear takeaways that people could use in the further generation of either games or sp speaking about games, um, what have you. I'd like that to be expanded a little bit more, but um, I'll leave it at that. As far as, as, far as Gamergate, We've been extremely lucky. Uh, we have not been doxxed. Um, we haven't, you know, haven't had our website taken over. Um, all that sort of stuff. But it's uh, Gamergate. There were very few channels between Gamergate and the games academia, and it largely centered around uh, a few organizations. Um, but it's it's uh, I I I don't know what else to say. It didn't really affect us too much, um, mainly because we didn't have prominent women writers at the time uh, writing and talking out against Gamergate at the same time. I think if we did, if we had certain authors, Gamergate was a, a was a, a masterful hit piece uh, on mass, just a long for a long time. And it was just focused on a select number of writers and a select number of topics. It was not about ethics in games journalism. It was not about any of these things. It was about uh, sexist ranting and uh, targeting uh, specific people um, for trying to insert politics into a very political object. So. Does that this is for Nick as well. I'm interested if maybe you could touch a bit more on that issue of reputation when it comes to this kind of feed forward thing, because that to me seems like one of the biggest issues for the success of this, this the inertia of not being able to get good academics yep. because they need to be somewhere where they're taken seriously. Yep. Kind of uh, it's, it's been incredibly difficult. Luckily, we've been uh, pretty successful as far as uh, getting on syllabi. So we've, we've had good success writing for or at least for professors seeing us as writing for students, um, which is perfect, I'll take it. Um, there'll be a future developer in there somewhere that uses something. But it's, it's very difficult um, to craft our reputation on nothing. A lot of open access journals will use uh, advisory boards to beef up their standing. Um, we decided not to do that um, simply because we didn't want people to tell us no a lot. <laughs> um, so it was, it was just, uh, it's, a, it's a, a sort of hit or miss thing where you just have to go with it. And we hope the inertia and the momentum will come with it. 
Um, we hope that that hasn't already died. <laughs> this is always a problem that we're going to have. Um, but I think we've carved out a space. It's just looking to expand that space. And I think that can be done, that can happen through one or two articles. Um, it's just finding the right articles and finding the right thing to get more, more eyes on it. Uh, my name is Mariella. My question is for Sylvia. Um, hi. I was just wondering, um, I really appreciated what you had to say about um, faith and putting our hopes into the way that uh, kind of like the realistic things about the world is that it's not looking so good. And mm. I was just kind of hoping to get your take on the difference between faith and hope and what we can kind of look towards to put our ideas in a place where it could be properly founded instead of an empty idea. Um, maybe this, like, this is just me speaking from a position of, like, means and that I can do this, but I would say that hope is something that you can, like, take control of in yourself. Um, like, for me, like, I'm a trans woman, and so, like, I, I see, like, I can understand why someone, like, wants to take, wants to, like, do, like, things to their body. Um, but for me, I see that as, I like, I don't, I don't put that, that trust in someone else. Like, for me, like, this is, it's very much, like, my own process on my own journey and like I if I um, am able to design like myself or really anything in that way well then I will and I think that um, a lot of the times like what you see other like otherwise is that is that is that that that, that doesn't happen um, and whether that's like putting trust in a brand or like another figure but uh, I think I think as long as you can like uh, like n know yourself and like know what you're capable of and like try and walk down that road then um, yeah then you might have hope but I also recognize that that's like incredibly hard um, so yeah thank you any other questions um, I as well your third Foundation. No, it was using solicitation. And I'm curious what your process of choosing your soliciting. Uh, if if I read it and I like, oh, so all the editors have this power where they can they can solicit. Um, it's it's where it's our demarcation between reviewer and editor. All editors have the ability to invite whoever they want. Um, so just dispersing it that way. But mostly it's if I like the writing and I can find a few. Uh, few articles or a few essays that this person has done, then I'll probably shoot them an invite. It's not like um, I, I try to keep up on critical distance as a major way to, to um, sort of find new people and do that sort of thing and through Twitter and find new people through there. Um, but it's, it's a very, there's no systematized way that I'm doing it at least. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you guys want to make any last comments? Thank y'all. <laughs> Thank you so much.